Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today. This is episode two of five in our new series on stereotypes. How did we get stuck with them? Why do they exist? Is there a way that we can break free of them? Or are they just part of us? Check out yesterday's episode that starts this conversation off. But today, what about the media? The media is sort of in the business of reaffirming stereotypes. Let's take some examples from my childhood. Video games. Mario. That is like a stereotype that runs around inside of your Nintendo, man. It's an Italian plumber with like a really bad accent and a silly mustache and a big nose and, and like he wears coveralls everywhere he goes and he jumps around on Goombas. This is weird. It's full of stereotypes. Then there's Super Punch-Out. Don't even get me started on this one. Okay, get me started, because I just started myself on it. Stereotypical portrayal up and down this whole game. The arcade version had an Italian fighter named Pizza Pasta. There was a guy who was French who was weak and went down easy named Glass Joe. There was a Russian guy named Soda Papinski. Originally, his name was not that. It was Vodka Drunkinski. So, you know, they just made it a little nicer. This is awful. Stereotypes all over the place. Street Fighter 2 has so many stereotypes, it basically just borders on racism. There's Dalsim, who has face paint, does yoga, it's an Indian guy, and he has shrunken skulls around his neck. There's Blanca, which is a wild beast man, representing a Brazilian Amazon. There's Zangief, which is like a Russian bear wrestling monster of a man who grunts in incomplete sentences, like Vladimir Putin. Have you ever noticed how many heroes in movies are stereotypes as well? Like, for example, there are people in movies, all the guys are like 6'2", brown hair, dark, complected. They kind of look like me, but musclier. Look at your games library. They got this in television, in movies, and in your video games. Mass Effect, Uncharted, Watch Dogs, Red Dead Redemption, Metal Gear Solid. All of these, same lead character. Slight variations. All of that's stereotypical. There's also portrayal in video games of black men as aggressive or obnoxious, or sometimes like the witty comic relief. Like, think Gears of War, think Halo, think Dead Island. And what's worse is these things might be stereotyping so heavily that they're entering into the realm of racism. One study published by Ohio State University found that white gamers who were forced to play as African-American characters who had these certain stereotypical dispositions were more likely to associate negative behaviors with people of color. They were more likely to act more aggressively toward people of color later after playing as these characters. And that's just video games. That's a pretty powerful medium. But there's something that we do a little more than video games, and that is music. A lot of people listen to music. Some people listen to music all day long, constantly. Certain types of music tend to draw from certain stereotypes. Rap and hip-hop music get a bad rap, not to make a pun, but they're glorifying the depreciation of women in a lot of these songs. They are glorifying gang violence, and many of this enforces some pretty disgusting stereotypes. But at the same time, music and rap as part of that is an art form which makes it very difficult to parse where the stereotypes are, where the characters are, where this is just part of the story of this song. At the same time, though, some of this hip-hop and rap is commercial art. It's out there to influence and to make money. They put this character into this storyline and did this stereotype in order to speak to this group of people so that they will buy your album. It's a really slippery slope to get onto, but it's all stereotypes. Unlike some other musicians, hip-hop artists at least are somewhat self-aware of this. In 1989, KRS-One, Cool Modi, MC Light, and a bunch of others jumped on a track called Self-Destruction, and its message and purpose was to warn folks of the damage of stereotypes in hip-hop. Check it out, it's actually pretty awesome, super meta. Other musical groups also stereotype. Let's not pick on hip hop and rap, you know. Pop music is all just like party, 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 we're all gonna get drunk, and it's mostly like upper middle class white kids. Country music is also mostly white people, but of a different social class. And then you replace like gang violence or parties with 
maybe what could be construed as trailer park activity, small town activity. You know, the, there's that classic joke, what do you get when you play country music backwards? You get your dog back, you get your truck back, you get your trailer back. These are all stereotypes that the media uses in order to speak to all of us. And it works because we speak this stereotype too. The WWF slash WWE has characters that are embodiments of stereotypes, both good and bad. Yokozuna is a sumo man. He sits on people, and his manager shouts at him in broken English. Yokozuna, number one. That is terrible. Tatanka is a Native American guy, very high energy, uncontrollable. Stone Cold Steve Austin is a beer drinking, you know, white trash guy, bald with a goatee, leather vest kind of guy. There's the Nation of Domination, which is a black power group. These are all drawn from stereotypes that society already holds. But when society has these stereotypes, are we making them and then putting them onto the media? Or is the media making them and putting them back onto us? Let's look at commercials and advertising, for example. Calvin Klein, for example, has advertisements where maybe there's like this sun-kissed blonde dude with six-pack on a horse or something. You know, there's also pink razors for women and there's blue stuff for little boys. And, you know, marketing and advertising, they look at society and then they try and target people. And they can and do say whatever they want. If there's a commercial for a dishwasher, and they show a mom doing the dishes. Is that a stereotype? I mean, it's hard to say, because it also could just be targeting. These companies do a lot of research to find out who buys their products. They don't just make ads willy-nilly. So maybe women are the ones who buy their products most. So they'd rather feature those women in their ads. The question is, do they then stereotype the women that they feature? Is the woman a white woman who lives in a certain house in a certain neighborhood and talks a certain way? Is the woman a Indian woman who lives in a certain house in a certain place and talks a certain way? That's where the stereotypes come in. Just showing them one way or the other, that's a little more of a gray area. It could just be that the ad's racist, because that happens too sometimes. And then they usually get banned. You can look on YouTube for some of those. Some of them are pretty crazy. But commercials and advertising are more akin to the questions about music and whether they're just targeting a specific demographic. And that brings us to, like, Hollywood. Does Hollywood do that, too? Are they just targeting demographics with their stereotyping? There are studies that show that the audience would reject movies that have anything but a white male lead. And they think maybe this has to do with something called the coconut effect. From the days of radio, you would take two halves of coconut, and you bang them together, and it was like the standard way to generate the sound effect of a radio program of horse hooves, also used in the classic Monty Python movie. Horses don't actually sound like that, though. I don't know if you've ever heard a horse, but they don't sound like coconuts. And the problem is that the sound became so attached and ingrained in the public consciousness of, okay, this means horse that when they used a different horse sound in movies, people didn't understand what was happening. That's the coconut effect. And it could be the same with a white male lead. Perhaps people are just so used to seeing a white male lead that they expect to continue to see it. In a 2008 study, this was before Interstellar, before Gravity and The Hunger Games, all with very strong female leads and great box office success, a study showed that men in leading roles sold significantly more tickets. Based on this 2008 study, the studio is going to gamble on a male lead because it seems as though female leads only make about half as much at the box office. So here are some numbers. Female leads generated in the domestic box office about $54.5 million, whereas male leads generated $101 million. The opening weekend in the box office, $18 million for female leads, $32.2 million for male leads. Even translated into DVD sales, female leads $32.2 million, males $64.6 million. These numbers are strikingly almost half of each other. The male lead making double what the female lead makes in almost every situation. But all of this data is super skewed because the male lead roles traditionally had a larger marketing budget than the female lead roles did. And these are comparable movies. We're looking at blockbuster films. So 
some people went through this data and they found that if they had even or equal marketing budgets, there should be no difference in the ticket sales between a female lead and a male lead. So does that mean the data is skewed and not us? Or does it mean that we are skewed so we give males more marketing money for their movies? It's hard to say, but it gets worse. The New York Film Academy found that from 2007 to 2012, 28 percent of all women on screen wore revealing clothing and 26 percent of all women get partially nude in their acting women purchase 50 percent of all movie tickets so what's going on here why is all these ladies wearing partially like revealing clothing getting kind of naked even the un chimed in on this new york film academy study the undersecretary general and the executive director of UN Women called the study a wake-up call for the global film industry. With their powerful influence, she said, on shaping the perceptions of large audiences, the media are the key players for gender equality agenda. With influence comes responsibility. So maybe it's not actually the audience after all. Maybe it's an equality issue that's also reinforcing and generating these stereotypes. I mean, Hollywood decision makers are deciding what movie they want to make and how much marketing to put behind that movie, not necessarily based on how well the movie's going to do, but how well they trust the lead. And they're going to trust the male lead more, maybe because they themselves are men, or because of some other stereotype. Stereotypes can influence so many different things that we do, especially when we're not aware of them. So. Maybe we should do a series on equality one day. Why don't you let us know in the comments if you think we should do that. But what do you think about all this? Do you think that stereotypes come from us, go into the media, and then come back? Or do you think there are some stereotypes that come from the media straight into us? So let us know down in the comments and come back tomorrow for more Test 2 Plus where we're gonna find out if these stereotypes are actually embedded within us. And if you haven't yet, check out yesterday's episode on stereotypes. And if you already have done that, check out last week's episodes all about fear. They're awesome. Thanks for watching. I'm Trace. See you tomorrow on Test 2 Plus.